Okay, thank you so much. Um, thank you. Oops. I am just overwhelmed and deeply honored to be the recipient of this award um, in honor of a man who um, I admired hugely, like most people in the audience, and who you might be surprised to learn actually did influence my career from quite an early stage. When I offered this title, Heretical Thoughts and Challenging Orthodoxy Improves Breast Cancer Care, I didn't realize I'd only actually have 20 minutes to do it because it actually deserves a whole book. But I'm going to actually stick with the title because I think it epitomizes Umberto Veronese's personal life and his professional life. And um, so bear with me, I'm going to try and do it in 20 minutes, but take a personal view um, by showing some of the historical work that I've been involved in that uh, he inspired. All good scientists that are in the audience here know that if you're going to do innovative work, you have to be prepared to think or imagine the unthinkable. This um, is a painting of a very eminent um, physician, Sir Arthur Hurst, who um, was at Guy's Hospital. And he wrote in the Guy's Hospital Gazette in 1930 that cancer would trouble the surgeon of the future in very small numbers only. So this fits neatly with uh, Monica's uh, talk just now. And he confidently hoped that the prevention of cancer would be in sight 25 years from now. Well, maybe that was a tad optimistic, but I think that we are getting somewhere to some of the things that he foretold in 1930. So let's actually scroll on now, 38 years, and believe it or not, that's me. <laughs> um, now, the treatment of breast cancer at Guy's Hospital in 1968 really actually rather shocked me. Um, breast cancer surgery ranged from full halstered radical mastectomies to the odd lumpectomy based entirely on surgeon belief or preference. Worse still, from my point of view of complete naivety, Patients with more advanced tumors had bilateral oophorectomy, others adrenalectomy, and some went off to see the, neuroscientist, the uh, neurosurgeon for a hypophysectomy. What, of course, people were doing by these seemingly barbaric procedures were examining the importance of hormones um, in breast cancer. We had no multidisciplinary teams or specialist nurses, and quite frankly, very little, if any, informed consent to many of the experimental treatments that were uh, being performed. So what was Umberto Veronese doing in 1968 when I was really concerned about what was happening to these women with breast cancer? Well, actually, he was already looking at a series of um, over a 1,000 patients um, uh, treated uh, and beginning to question whether or not really extensive excision of mammary tissue was actually um, what was necessary. And also looking at uh, the sorts of um, ways in which hormonal sort of influences were helping um, a tumor progress or not. So let's scroll on now another um, 16 odd years by which time I've left nursing and um, I'm actually sort of uh, got a PhD in experimental psychology and neuroscience. I actually bowled up for one reason or another that I haven't got time to go into at the CRC Clinical Trial Center in Kings, working with Michael Baum, who was another pioneer like Umberto, who really did actually question orthodoxy. Should we be doing things differently? He was extremely keen to introduce me to Professor Veronese 
and um, I have never ever forgotten um, that first meeting because it was to be quite pivotal in a lot of things that I went on to do. Breast cancer treatment in 1984 was still being performed mainly in the UK by general surgeons, not specialists. Mastectomy was still the primary treatment. Breast conserving procedures um, by many were considered actually quite heretical. Um, and certainly from my point of view as a psycho-oncologist, term psycho-oncology, quality of life, hardly ever appeared in publications or in presentations. Indeed, if you do a search, you'll find that in 1984, only eight publications had quality of life and cancer in their title. So one of the reasons that Mike employed me and why he was so keen that I met Umberto was um, to actually um, be involved in establishing the psychological aspects of a randomized trial that he was launching comparing a mastectomy with breast conservation in patients with early um, uh, breast cancer. The primary aim was, of course, to add to knowledge that we were gaining worldwide about the safety of breast conserving procedures and to test the assumption that it wouldn't actually produce the sorts of unremitting psychological morbidity that was associated with breast loss and mastectomy. It was dubbed the trial that everyone needed, but actually nobody wanted, and failed dismally to recruit. But we did manage to do a small psychosocial study. This was published in the um, BMJ in 1986. And what we found, much to the huge surprise of everyone, that there was actually no difference in psychological morbidity between those patients who had a mastectomy and those who had breast conserving procedures. Furthermore, there was also no difference in their sexual activity. So this troubled quite a few people but one of the things that I was already quite interested in was, remember, these were women who'd agreed to be randomized, was, well, how much did they buy in to the treatments? Did they understand what was actually happening to them? More than half complained that their communication had been inadequate. And we'll come back to that uh, point in a moment. Now, challenging orthodoxy is never going to make you many friends. That study in the UK received widespread publicity, but was heavily criticized. Some of the sorts of reasons that people gave was that women didn't choose their treatments. So those prepared to be randomized were not a typical population. And if we gave women choice of surgical procedures wherever possible, then most, first of all, would dress would choose breast conservation, and the huge psychosocial benefits of this would be much more obvious to everybody. So what do you do when people raise such challenges? You test those assumptions. So we launched the CHOICE study, a prospective multi-center study that capitalized on the preferences and motivational differences of patients plus their surgeons. We recruited 269 women um, who were being treated by 22 surgeons in 12 different UK hospitals. The patients had whatever was the procedure in the hospital surgery, plus or minus radiotherapy or chemotherapy. Most of the postmenopausal had tamoxifen. And I assessed their anxiety and depression using lots of standardized measures um, up till three uh, years post-surgery. So one of the first papers we published, again in the BMJ, um, what I want to sort of show you here, if you follow the top line, we saw 30 women who actually were being treated by surgeons who favored mastectomy wherever possible. 121 women who were being treated by surgeons who felt very committed to putting breast conservation up front as primary surgery. 
and um, another 118 patients being treated by surgeons who genuinely believe that they spent a long time um, discussing the choices and the options with women. Now, what's quite interesting from that table is that um, there were actually many mastectomies in both the um, breast conservation and choice surgeons groups. This was, of course, usually due to technical reasons, such as a central lump in a very small breast. Only 62 of the 118 women in the choice surgeons group actually chose their uh, surgery. And when they did, a third of them did actually opt for mastectomy. Now, what about anxiety and sexual dysfunction at 12 months? As you can see from this slide here, there was no statistically significant difference between the treatments, okay? In fact, the sorts of figures we saw were very similar to those that we actually had in the earlier criticized randomized trial. So this is a bit peculiar, but let's press on and see if there are any other, any other differences. We looked at the effect of surgeon type on psychological morbidity. And what you can see here is that those women who were treated by choice surgeons evidenced less morbidity than the other groups. And this was still um, apparent at two and at three years. But as there was no significant difference in psychological morbidity either between treatments or between those in the choice surgeons group who had a real choice and those who could not choose, what is going on? Remember in the randomized trial, I was struck by how over half of the women said that they actually felt communication had been very poor. So we actually looked at patients' perception of information at diagnosis when they were making decisions. And what you can see from this slide here is that those women who perceived the information about the logic, rationale for treatment as good, were less likely to be anxious and or depressed at 12, 24, and 36 um, months post-surgery. And what was interesting was that significantly more of the women treated by the choice surgeons perceived their information as having been good irrespective um, as to whether or not they could be offered choice. So these surgeons, when we listened to their interviews with patients, were generally better communicators. And it shows that patients' desire for autonomy is actually often less strong than their need for very clear and accurate information. So communication in breast cancer, because of all the amazing advances that have been made in our knowledge about the molecular biology of the disease, in the development of different procedures um, and, and treatments, has become very, very complicated. And um, I think the period that exists between a patient receiving her diagnosis and then having to make decisions about um, what management policy to follow um, is really difficult. It's thwarted by time pressures in many of our clinics. And a need to make a rapid decision um, uh, set against the backdrop of fear and anxiety can really hamper somebody's cognitive reasoning. If we're going to make educated, informed choices about which treatment policies to follow, this actually requires the absorption of a huge amount of information. And in the context of life threat, many lay populations do believe that more aggressive treatment is better. And of course, that probably feeds into why, despite many recommendations, many women will still opt for what we seem to see as over-treatment. Any ambiguous or diffident communication that patients receive from their healthcare professionals also feeds into that myth. And Adding a discussion 
about a clinical trial where you're obviously going to be disclosing anxiety is going to complicate things further. So let's go back to again something that uh, Monica had been mentioning about escalating when necessary but de-escalating whenever possible. Professor Veronese made huge contributions to clinical trials that influenced practice of, I should su suggest, everyone in this room. Not only was he interested in establishing safety and reducing the harms of surgical treatments, but also, um, as Paolo mentioned, he was keen on improving patients' quality of life. My own um, research team have been involved in many related trials to the sorts of work that he was doing. Uh, we were looking at sentinel node biopsy in the Almanac study. We're currently working on POSNAC, looking at the um, need for um, radio or radiotherapy or, or axillary clearance and intraoperative uh, radiotherapy in target. More recently, where you've been involved in looking at surgery or active monitoring for, sorry, Monica, uh, low-risk DCIS patients, and um, Nostra, no surgery if you get a pathological complete um, uh, response. So those are things sort of to do with surgery, but I think, um, as we'll hear, I'm sure, over the next few days, there's a lot of emphasis now on systemic treatments um, to be targeted on those women most likely to benefit using the new and quite amazing genomics. Now, explaining the logic for um, treatment options using some of these tests is not as um, straightforward as one might think. Eric Weiner, um, last year, when the Taylor X study was reported, said that uh, uh, a number at the end of the day is just a number. There's a lot more you need to be doing uh, around that. And one of the problems when we're explaining these complex things to patients with breast cancer is that health numeracy and literacy levels are actually worldwide very low. Many of the words and concepts that we become inured to are meaningless, counterintuitive, or ambiguous. Um, the other problem is that oncologists' own communication about the risks, harms, and benefits um, associated with novel treatments, procedures, and test results are subject to all sorts of unconscious biases and misunderstandings. So unless we have a healthcare professional with a huge repertoire of different ways to explain things for patients of different socio-educational and psychological sort of uh, dispositions, the women are probably not making very informed choices um, between the options um, given to them. Now, I just want to spend the last few minutes talking about some newer work that we've been doing around um, this area. Unfortunately, we haven't actually yet published any of these data, so I can't share all the results with you, but essentially, we designed with uh, funding from the Breast Cancer um, uh, uh, Research Foundation, designed, ran, and then evaluate eight-hour small group educational workshops for healthcare professionals when they're discussing different risk scores with diverse patient groups. It's easy to actually produce um, glossy educational programs, but if you're only if you're actually trying to get transfer of new one skills into the clinic setting, you've actually got to do two things. You've got to improve objectively the participant's competence at talking about things in different ways, improve their self-confidence as well in doing this. And uh, we do know um, that we have actually managed to achieve both of those things and that most participants on these um, found them really helpful and want all their colleagues to go on them. So the present and the future compared with 1984 when I first met um, Umberto Veronese. 
Um, prevention and improved diagnostics. Yes, we haven't actually achieved what uh, Sir Arthur Hurst had hoped, but we're getting there. We've got dedicated breast centers and much better treatments. I think the future will also see precision surgery using big data, genomics, and artificial intelligence to ensure that the right patient has the right operation at the right time. Obviously, targeting and tailoring systemic treatments is an increasingly important goal, and many novel in in innovations that are doubtless going to be talked about um, over the next few days um, are sometimes impressive, but they've still got to be evaluated appropriately. There is lots more work also going on um, looking at supportive interventions to help with quality of life, threatening side effects, um, and long-term survivorship issues. Um, considering, as Umberto always used to point out, the whole woman, not just her breast. And obviously training multidisciplinary teams in better communication and provision of information is coming along. But let me go back to the title of this um, talk, Heretical Thoughts and Challenging Orthodoxy Improves Breast Cancer Care. I think in the past, and probably even now, surgical trials were generally difficult, hence the reliance on case series. It's well worth revisiting a brilliant editorial in The Lancet by um, Richard Horton called Surgical Research or Comic Opera. If we're going to actually, though, involve people in the trials that we need about innovative ideas, we actually have to get cooperation. And this is an ideal that I suggest is often tainted by rivalries and power plays amongst people. Some clinicians still will always cling to medical orthodoxy, doing what they've always done and getting what they've always got. Others will challenge constantly, and each believes very firmly that, of course, right is on their side. The proponents of orthodoxy are often accused of being unscientific, paradigm-bounded, with vested interests, faulty ideas, or personal prejudices. Challengers like Umberto, Mike Baum, I'd like to almost mention myself as well, often have their own dissent and heresy attributed to psychological flaws or slightly lefty um, failings. But thinking the unthinkable was a really important mantra for Umberto Veronese, stimulating some fantastic research that has really benefited women with breast cancer. He used to say you should always think bigger and conceive studies that represent a breakthrough for medicine. So, grazie professori for inspiring and encouraging a very naive young psycho-oncologist, for being appropriately critical when I deserved it and got things wrong, for always being prepared to share a laugh for being much amused and impressed by the fact that I love Italian opera, uh, particularly um, uh, Puccini. And finally, in this deeply divided, troubled, sometimes extremely violent world of ours, being like me, a committed nonconformist and pacifist. Thank you.